Well, that was some great singing. What a joy to praise God together. You know, I, I know I, I get a lot out of listening to you, you sing, and I just pray that God, and I know God does, gets even more. So God bless you for being here tonight, for coming back on this beautiful day and lifting up our voices in praise to God. We are in a series on Galatians that we're calling uh, Freedom, Living in the Spirit. There, it is such a tragedy to see someone move to a better place in their life and then turn around and walk backwards. To walk out of something that's bringing them harm or hurting them or, or making them to be sad and yet turn around and, and walk right back into that situation. I mean, we all want to move forward in life. I mean, it's kind of ingrained in us. I'm sure as a little baby, I couldn't wait to get out of the baby crib and into a big, big child's bed. Now, how that worked in my family growing up, we had the crib. And uh, I'm sure like most children, little boys, I tried to crawl out of the crib. So... As a toddler, my parents put me in a, a training bed. I, don't, I haven't seen one recently, but basically what it was, it was a half crib. It had rails on the top and you could get in and out at the bottom. Problem was I slept like what my dad said was a rabbit. I slept upside down in my bed, so the rails that were there to keep me from falling out at night as a child didn't work so well and I fell out and broke my collarbone. So I was, they put me back in the bed because I fell out and I started crying and they just thought I was being an ornery little boy. And, the next day when I was still crying, they finally took me to the doctor and I had a broken bone. I'm saying, Mom and Dad, see, every problem in my life is because you abused me as a toddler. <laughs> but you know, we want to move forward in life. And then we want, can't wait to get out. A couple of weeks ago, I told you about what I, I thought Mom stood for, M-O-M, -M, my own maid. And when it came to go, time to go to college, she told me what it really stood for, move out, mister. You know, and I, it was okay. I was kind of excited to go. I've also told you that when I went to college, I was looking forward to the four F's. And which would be fun, females, freedom, and freedom, and fast food, because I was from Midabelle, we didn't have good food there. So I was looking for that, and my freshman year of college, that's exactly what I found, four Fs. <laughs> it's not true, but, but you know, there's times in our life where we want to, we, we're looking forward to move forward into something, and uh, yet it doesn't oftentimes work out for us. And so after I made those four Fs, what was I gonna do, move back home? And if I didn't like my mom, I was going to move back in a baby bed. You know, we're not made to move backwards. We're made to move forward in life. And nothing looks worse than when a, a child finds that freedom that they're supposed to have and yet denies it and moves backward. The children of Israel were a great example of this. A, a, a bad example of it. A good example or a bad example. We don't want to do that. Remember, they, they found themselves in slavery in Egypt. And so they prayed and they called out to God, please help us to get out of this slavery. They, they, uh, we don't have enough food to eat. They're abusing us. They're killing us. Please help us to escape. And God hears their, their plea and he answers. And they find themselves in the wilderness and they look backwards and say, oh God, where have, what have you done to us? Well, back in Egypt... We want to go back to that food we had there and the work that we had there. What a tragic thing to find freedom from the slavery only to want to turn around and go back. And yet it's not just true for those children. For what God tried to show them was that there is a freedom ahead. And he tried to show them how to live their lives and so he gave them the law. And later on when the law proved to not bring the freedom that God's children need, Jesus, God, in the fullness of time, sent his son Jesus for his people to discover that freedom is not found in the law. It's found in the grace of Christ. And yet how sad it is to find that freedom in Christ and to turn around and walk backwards, to go back to the law and try to live by our own righteousness. See, as Christians today, those of us who are Christians, we have been set free and we are to see things differently, not from a worldly point of view. Things have completely changed. We are a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 and 17, very clearly. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And so as Christians, we are new. How tragic would it be for us to go back and put on the old clothes, to try, to try and live like that 
captured by sin, enslaved to sin anymore. The new is here. The old has gone. And to make this very clear in Galatians to those folks who are struggling with the freedom found in Christ, Paul makes it very clear. So we're going to start at the end and work backwards. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. <laughs> but here I am. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, you know who you were, but that person died. And yet we are called to live, except it's not us living. It is Christ living in us. And if I start acting like, I, like who I was then instead of who I am now, what, is, what does that make me? If I'm a Christian and I start living like who I was then instead of who I am now, what does that make me? Well, Paul is going to say that makes you a hypocrite. And does any of us like hypocrisy? I mean, the word just makes us cringe. It makes us think of actions of others. You know, we've probably heard, and it's been very popular to describe hypocrisy or a hypocrite with that actor um, uh, metaphor. You know, it's an actor that puts on a, a mask and, and, and acts out what the mask says he is, that character. He performs behind a mask, and that's a very popular understanding, and there's some, there's some truth in it. And what Paul is saying is we need to be very careful that as Christians, we are not putting on a mask of this world and acting like this world. We need to be very, very careful. Now, this is true for the church today, but Paul sees how this is vital for the early church, that first century church. In Acts chapter 5, it never, used the word, never uses the word hypocrisy. But in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, that is the problem. I mean, they're the ones who wanted to be like Barnabas and get the, all the respect and glory that Barnabas had received. So they go and, like he had sold a field, they go sell a field. Except instead of giving it all, they decide to keep part of it. But so people will think of them like they did Barnabas. They say they, they're giving it all. I mean, it was their money. They could give it all or they could keep part. It was no, no problem either way. But they tried to act like something they were not. Peter says, you're not sinning against us. You're sinning against God. And if Ananias and Sapphira, acting like Christians but not being Christians, just putting on a mask, had become leaders in the church as Barnabas was a leader in the church, can you imagine the damage that would have done to the early church? To have leaders like that? And so that kind of explains the seriousness of, of lying and hypocrisy. And Ananias and then Sapphira were struck down dead. It's that serious. Perhaps one of the most frightening aspects of the sin of hypocrisy is that it can enter into our lives without us almost even realizing it. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23 not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. I mean, it's pretty easy to act like Christians at times, and yet not be one. And it's a very dangerous sin. And it's not something that was just new in the New Testament. While the, the, the term hypocrisy is not necessarily one that's very popular in the Old Testament, the actions of hypocrisy are definitely noticed. Religious hypocrisy is really nothing new at all. It happens anytime people try to look religious on the outside with letting Christ reign on the inside. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord says... These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. I mean, it's all in actions. It's all in just the words. It's in the nearness they are with him. But who they are, their hearts are not changed. 
So what's God condemning in this verse? That they were doing the right thing? No, they were doing the right things. The actions were not wrong, but he is condemning the fact that their hearts were not right. And so, brother and sister in Christ, you understand where we are here in the lesson. We have been crucified with Christ, right? And yet we're not dead. We live. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not me, that person that died that lives. It's Christ living in me. And so I am alive in this world. Do Christians still act like hypocrites? Yes, they do. Too many times, you and I, brother and sister, we, we go out into this world, and instead of acting like the Christian we are, we act like the world, which means if Christ has changed my heart, and I am a Christian, and all of a sudden I start acting like the world, I am then a hypocrite, right? I am putting on the mask of Christ or the mask of the world. Now, if I'm a Christian and Christ dwells in my heart and I'm going to be worldly, I have to cover up Christ with the world. And so I put on a mask. So many times when we talk about hypocrites, it's about hypocrites in the church. Well, it is true. Those are in the church. Christians are hypocrites in this world. And we need to stop being that way. That's not who we want to be. Zig Ziglar tells a story about he how he invited a friend to church one day. And uh, the man answered that, well, I'd like to go, but the church is so full of hypocrites. And Zig Ziglar quoted as responding and saying, that's okay, there's always room for one more. <laughs> you know, I don't like a hypo hypo hypocrisy and neither do you. But if I am a Christian, if Christ dwells in my heart, I am not a hypocrite at church when I am letting Christ show through me. I'm a hypocrite on Friday night or Monday morning. I'm a hypocrite when I cover up Christ with my worldliness. I mean, for, for right now, brother and sister in Christ, we are here together to worship and learn and grow closer to Christ. You are a Christian. And you're letting Christ show through right now. You are not a hypocrite. And yet, when we act hypocritically, we say, well, I guess I shouldn't go to church. Well, if you're a Christian, that's when you're taking off the mask of the world. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I can argue this both ways. You understand what I'm saying? It's just so many times we're made to feel guilty for going to church when we should be feeling guilty because how we acted on the weekend. I mean, this is the one place you should be. So if you're going to give up something, give up Friday night. Don't give up Sunday morning. This is where we ought to be. So we say we're Christians, but sometimes we act like the world. So I preached a little bit, didn't I? Let's go back to our text and let Paul preach this sermon. Here's Paul's sermon on this and his illustration. Verses 1 and 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running. I, I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Some of you were in the marathon this morning. You wanted to stay on track. You didn't want to run in vain. You didn't want to have to run farther than you had to. And Paul's saying, so 14 years ago, I go to Jerusalem to the esteemed leaders to make sure that I was running a race that, that, that God working through them validated. And I went to them. I want to be on the right track. I want to be headed for the right goal. I want to be running the right race. And so when I went there, verse 3, not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. The matter arose because some false believers had inf infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. The Judaizers, or the circumcision group, snuck, snuck in and they spied on us. And we are free from the law. We are saved by grace. It's not by acts of righteousness or things done internally. Christ has cleansed our, cleansed our hearts. And so Titus, even though a Greek, he wasn't circumcised. He didn't have to be proselyted and become a Jew to become a Christian. 
And we made that very, very clear, but they wanted to enslave us to the law. Verses seven through nine. They recognized that I had been entrusted, those leaders, with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. He said, okay, we all have the same gospel. Now, Peter, he's going to focus on the Jewish people, that they might become Christians. They might understand the grace of God, how you're not saved by keeping the acts of the law, but you're saved by the cross of Christ and him crucified and how he died for our sins once and for all. And they are washed away. And Paul, he's going to go to these Gentiles who don't, may, maybe don't know about this one God. And he's going to reach them with that same truth. It is the same gospel. There's an old preacher, uh, Charles Spurgeon, who uh, compared his preaching to other preachers of the day when he, and he said, Whitefield and Wesley might preach the gospel better than I do, but they cannot preach a better gospel. I mean, other people might preach the gospel better than I can, but they cannot preach a better gospel than I can preach because it is the good news of what God has done in this world. And so Peter, he's preaching that good news, the gospel. And Paul, he's preaching it as well. They are both stewards of that message. But all of a sudden in our text, there comes a confrontation. You know, there are times in life when we act as we should not. And it hurts ourselves and it hurts God's church and his people. And times, confrontations must take place. And when they happen, we ought to make sure that the issues are clear and they are compelling and they should be handled in truth and love. And not all conflicts are the same. And so I'm not saying that this confrontation between Paul and Peter is, the way, is a model that we should always follow. But here is what Paul does. Verse 11, when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Peter had acted in such a way as to cause harm on the church. And it's not a little thing. It is not over what color the carpet is in the church building. It's not over something small. It is over something quite large. And Peter acts in such a way publicly that Paul opposes it publicly. Now, stay with me and we'll understand why. Here's what Peter did. Verse 12. For before certain men came from James, from Jerusalem, he used, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group, the Judaizers. The one that thought before you could become a Christian, you had to become a Jew to become a Christian. In other words, you had to be circumcised. You had to become a Jew first. You had to follow the ways of the law. And so Peter has been acting like, no, you don't have to follow the ways of the law because of the dietary rules. He would eat with Gentiles. He would go into their homes, which is, would make him unclean according to the Jewish law. So he says, I, I'm going to eat with you. But then when these the Judaizers come to town from Jerusalem, He's, he doesn't want to cause a conflict here. So he steps back and he stops meeting with the Gentiles. He stops going into their homes and eating with them and fellowshipping with them. Now, I'm not for sure why Peter would act this way. Maybe there's probably some good motives. Um, he wanted to keep peace. Uh, he, he was kind of shocked or surprised. I mean, Peter could be a brave guy, right? I mean, he could. But he could make some pretty impressive mistakes as well. He was just a human, he was very, very weak. And so he stops meeting with the Gentiles. Can you imagine the message that sent to others? Verse 13, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. <laughs> did, did Peter's action have an impact on others? Absolutely. To all the other Jews, the Gentiles were in the majority here, but to all the other Jews that might have been around, all of a sudden they start saying, well, well maybe, 
maybe, uh, you know, I shouldn't eat with Gentiles like I was raised. And so they start to pull back from the brothers and the sisters and not go into that full fellowship with them. Peter, a leader in the church, had such an impact that Barnabas followed his influence, his example. Now that's, that's pretty impressive because who was there 14 years ago with Paul in Jerusalem with Titus? You think that our actions as church leaders, as Christians, don't influence others in the church? That we can't lead others astray? You see, a hypocrite is a person who says one thing and acts a different way. Would Peter have ever said that Gentiles could not be Christians? No, he would not. Would Peter have ever taught that you could not eat with Gentiles? He would not. He learned this lesson with food, did he not? You know, dream. I mean, he got the lesson. He got the message, the memo from God. Took him a few times, but he got the memo. And yet his actions said the opposite. And Paul makes it very clear. He was being a hypocrite. He was saying one thing, and he was doing another. And if Paul had opted for peace and not confronting, his actions would have gone unrebuked, and can you imagine what would have happened to that church? How they would have started separating until there were two churches. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in front of them all, this is it, this is what we're all been after, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? <laughs> Peter, which mask are you wearing? I mean, you're a Jew. Peter, by nationality, was a Jew. But you live like a Gentile. You eat and fellowship with, with all people. You don't keep the food laws, dietary laws. And yet, <laughs> you... Uh, you're telling Gentiles, I'm getting confused here. Who are you, Peter? I mean, what Peter is doing by action could divide this church. So they can't go into each other's homes and fellowship. That would be bad enough, right? But we came together today. And what meal did we come together to share? And if you're saying we can't gather around the table in the homes, how in the world can we gather around the same table at church? Can you imagine the implications Peter's actions, if not checked here, might have led to in the future? Verses 15 and 16. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, because that's how they looked at them, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in, in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one is justified. I mean, I grew up a Jew. I know the law. And the law cannot justify me. It cannot erase my sins. I cannot be righteous enough to cover all my sins. But Jesus could. And I am saved by faith. Not by my works, but by the works of Christ. And I am justified by Jesus Christ. I have that freedom. Why in the world would I go back to the law? I am a Christian. Why would I wear the mask of the law? I am free from that. I don't have to live that way any longer. I live by faith, not the law. Verse 19, for through the, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. Paul knew this. Paul tried to follow the law. So much so he was going to Damascus to, to imprison Christians. I mean, he was all out for the law. You couldn't be more into it than he was. And did that save him? No, but Jesus appeared to him. And he learned what Christ had done on the cross. And he was baptized. His sins were washed away. And he could live by faith. And boy, did he act. You better believe it. It changed his life. 
And you could see it in every action that followed. Why in the world would he want to go back to a way that did not bring that freedom? In no way would it make sense for us to accept salvation by faith and then work for it. Just as it would make no sense for me to accept a gift and then pay for it. <laughs> By identifying with Christ, we've experienced freedom from the law that he gave us through his death on the cross. And because of that, I've responded to it. Have you? Verse 20. I, Paul goes personal here. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ <laughs> lives in me. I mean, I, I died. That old person died, and he was gone. There was nothing left to live, but Christ lives in me, so I have a new life. <laughs> the, the life I live in, now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Listen, if my actions alone, righteousness through the law could save me, why did Christ have to die? And everybody understands that wouldn't have worked. We can't save ourselves. So Paul says, I have been, I was crucified with Christ. We are not to live the crucified life. We're not to live a life of death. You understand that, right? We are to live the resurrected life. That's what we're called to. We're to live life. And if we could be saved by doing good, then why did Christ have to die? But we can't. So the cross is the only way to salvation. Well, did, did Peter get it? I, I think he did. In fact, I, I, know, I know he did. You see, the, the law is not the way of life, and Peter understood it. He knew that the wall, law was the way of death. The law kills us so that the gospel might raise us up. You know, um, neither Galatians nor Acts record Peter's response to Paul's rebuke. But if you go into Peter's writings, you kind of get the fact that he understood. In fact, if you want to turn over into his later writings, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, Peter would write this. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. <laughs> so here's what Peter has to say about Paul's writings. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, <laughs> as they do the other scriptures to their own destructions. So Peter's saying, listen to the words of Paul, and we just listen to them. Sometimes it's hard to get, but don't distort them. Listen to what he had to say. And then Peter continues in verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. And the church says, amen. You think Peter got it? He, he saw what he had done. And he calls us to listen and to hear and do not fall from the grace that we have received. Remember who lives in you. 
Remember who you were. And remember that you are not that person any longer. That is not you. Remember who you are now. And don't go back to slavery. Don't go back behind the bars of the prison cell that you were in and shut the door yourself. Go forward into the salvation you have received. Don't be a hypocrite. If you've given your life to Christ, Christ lives in you. He is in you. Do not cover it up with the ways of this world. Let it shine through. Don't act like you are in the world and the world is in you. Act like you are in Christ and Christ is in you. And don't carry around that stinking dead body that you buried. It's gross. It's ugly. It's disgusting. And nobody likes it. So quit wearing the mask of who you were because you're just being a hypocrite when you do it. You are free in Christ. Be free. Don't go backwards. Stop being a hypocrite in the world. You're a Christian. Be one. Show it and live it. Wow. I think Paul preached a pretty powerful message that Peter heard, and I hope we do as well. Well, I hope you'll reflect on it this week. I hope it makes a difference in how you act tomorrow, at school, at work, in your life, and in the week to come. We're going to offer an invitation. If you've never put on Christ in baptism, that's what you're called to do. The grace of God will wash you clean. He will live in you. And you have to submit to it. You have to understand you're, you can't be in control any longer. You'd be Lord of your life. If you want to give your life to Christ in baptism tonight, we want to help you do that. Brothers and sisters, we sing this song. I hope you'll too just reflect. Are we living like God wants us to? And if we can help you, we'd love to pray with you and pray for you. If you need to respond publicly, we invite you to come as we stand together and sing. I was